Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NHS Project Future session on the government's uh, functional standard on project delivery. Um, so my name is Paul Tritton. I'm the deputy director for the major projects portfolio in DHSC, and I'm your host for this session, um, which is going to introduce the, the functional standard content and advise how organisations can assess themselves and develop uh, their improvement plans. Um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Robert Buttrick, uh, who is going to lead this afternoon session. So Robert is an international authority on project delivery with a successful track record for building capability in a number of sectors, including health, telecoms, infrastructure, and doing so across a variety of countries. Now, specifically for this session, uh, Robert is the architect, actually, of the UK's, UK government's project delivery uh, functional standards. And I had the pleasure of working with him a few years ago when, the, when these were first developed. So it's good to see they've stood the test of time um, and apply, actually, in a number of, of government departments already. Now, Robert is also a published author. He contributes to project management best practice and professional journals, as well as being a visiting fellow at the University of Warwick. And he's kindly giving away two of his published workout books uh, this week. Robert has also been awarded um, a Distinguished Service Certificate for services to national and international project management standards. He's an MBA, a Chartered Civil Engineer and an honor Honorary Fellow of the APM. And you can find more about him on his website, projectworkout.com. Now, just before I hand over to Robert, I just want to let you know what the format of this virtual event is. On the screen, you should uh, you should see a panel detailing the chat uh, and the Q&A. Hopefully the chat is, is an obvious function and the Q&A is for you to put questions to Robert as you think of them. And there will be a section in this presentation for these. And finally, there should be have been a game code given on the screen at the beginning of this session for arriving on time, which you can write down in the notes tab on, on the right hand side of the screen. And there should be another game code at the end of the session. Anyway, that's enough from me. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Robert. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, Paul and I, we first met when we started doing the first first version of the standard. So and as you say, it seems to be standing the test of time because it had a hell of a long tr trial period. And I also noticed Jamie, who was um, hosting Fiona Spencer's call um, session this first thing this morning. Uh, he was also on that group. So people seem to be crossing over between um, government departments, etc. And they've still got the same standard to go to. So in this one, I'm going to tell you a lot about the standard. I'm going to tell you about where it came from, um, some of its features, and then a bit about implementing it. So let's have a look then. So what is it? It's about setting expectations direction and management. So it's the direction because it's the senior responsible owners or project sponsors, as some people call them, and those managing, but it's for portfolios, programs and projects. So it's the whole P3M, as people often like to call it. And it's all about getting value for money, a successful and timely delivery of government policy, and also your own organization's strategic and business objectives. So it covers a, 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 a range of things there. But it's about really doing what we want to do, getting where we want to be, and providing good service for our, our citizens. Now, the standard, the project delivery standard, just one of a, of a set. And the sort of ones in the set, security, commercial, communications, property, I mean, they all follow the same pattern. They all use the same type of language. They all use the same glossary of terms where they share them. And this is important because, for instance, I'm sure you in the in the NHS, you'll be pretty keen. We've got a lot of property. So often the property standard will work with the project delivery standard. You've got a lot on um, commercial stuff because the number of contractors, suppliers you have. So these things fit together and they're designed as a suite. And the project delivery standard is just one of them. But it's all about getting consistent and improving collaborative practices across government, public sector generally. And these um, standards all follow a, a sort of um, a, set, a set set of principles. I'm just going to highlight two of them: the mutually consistent in terms of principles and the terminology. So, in other words, you don't have to learn somebody else's jargon to understand this. As you'll see later, the the what the readership for these is meant to be very widespread, and they won't necessarily be um, experts in the fields that they're reading about. So that's um, number three. And a number five there, um, 
it's their design to enable you folks there to develop and tailor methods, approaches, processes, whatever, to implement the standard. So it's not a straitjacket. It's not telling you you have to do things this way. And being a standard, one of the consistency things is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the British international standards. They have a particular sort of language. Some people don't like that language, but it's been there for a long time. And it's also been a long time in government. So for instance, if something says shall, that's a requirement, you have to do it. Um, if something says should, then that's a recommendation. But in a standard, a should means, well, you really ought to do it. And if you don't, you can, you should, you should explain why. May means permission. May I get down from the tables, for instance. Might means probability. Well, it might rain. Well, it is raining here, actually. And can means, well, it can happen. So you've got these words are very, very carefully chosen. Um, the old thing we tell kids, you know, can I get down from the table, please? Yes, you can, but you may not. They say, so it's a very sort of pedantic but necessary um, use of wording through these and, and that's absolutely necessary and you'll notice the word must doesn't appear if you're familiar with a lot of government legislation the word must is always a legal requirement so it's one above shall so let's see where it sits then on that basis the functional standards imagine it's a toblerone you've got the functional standard at the top there and basically that describes the what needs to happen and why it describes the practices and why on earth would you bother doing them it doesn't describe how you do them. That's in what they term a governance and management framework. So things like management policies, professional standards, subject specific standards, processes, codes of practice, handbooks, guides, a whole range of things ranging from absolutely have to do something like HM Treasury when you're getting money approved, um, right down to, to guides just to sort of teach you how to do certain things. And there's two lots, those really, for each government organization. There's stuff that's produced in the IPA, um, which is for use across the whole of government. Come to some of those in a minute. And I think Fiona, if you saw her, Fiona Spence, that is, if you saw her talk this morning, she was um, um, on that one. So what, what, they, what they'll produce is stuff that you can use all the way across government, no matter which part of the organization you're in. But then this is the great thing for you guys that you can have in each of your own organizations your own set of guidance suited for your needs your priorities etc and so they and by having a standard you're all working to that same sort of baseline and this is how the ipa present this the sort of government policy at the top that's that's the things we we have to do then the government functional standards plural that's all those other ones i showed you as well and then ipa producing the academy, the, the training development for you all. Then there's the project delivery framework, which has a lot of tools and things, workbooks and libraries going to come there. That's an ever growing feature. And then you've got the assurance framework, what we used to know as gateway reviews. And then along the bottom, the, there's your departmental project delivery frameworks and methodologies to draw off that. And project delivery in, um, in these terms equals portfolio program and project management so and those standards basically they are mandated they've been mandated since the end of september um, that came out in a dear accounting officers letter so what is in the project delivery standard um, basically it starts off with its set of principles and we'll go through some of these and then talks about context if you don't understand what a project or a program or portfolio is and what the difference is and there's lots of differences of opinion what those are then um, you, you'll be a bit lost so it does that and then what it does is it goes through governance mostly focusing on roles and decision making and assurance and then into the individual practices of portfolio program and project level and work package and then through to um, sort of other things that you have to do like manage risks co control change communication stakeholder engagement the sort of supporting part and i will go through those when i look at the different features but the important thing here is the structure You've got the host organization, whatever it is, and we're very careful because we use the word organization because you can define what the boundary of that is. But for heaven's sake, don't make it a sort of single business area. Um, so something like the MOD is massive. So they 
kind of chop it into about four or five pieces. So then they can have a portfolio. They can have at least one, because if they've got that by default, because the organization is the portfolio. And they can have more than one in there. And then portfolios can have sub portfolios. They have programs, projects. And there's this thing called other related work. And that's anything you don't, in a program or in a portfolio, you don't manage as a project. So basically, it can even include business as usual, which is very powerful when people get good at portfolio management. And this sort of structure is based on an emerging national international consensus. If you look at the um, latest international standards, you'll see a very similar diagram to that. Now, where did we get the stuff from when Paul and I were working those years ago to get version one? We, 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 um, we go, we're not proud, we'll take anything. We, um, external sources, of course, most of you, a lot of you have been through your Prince2 MSP type training. And so those are a primary source. We also draw on the international and British standards. We draw on the APM's body of knowledge, PMIs. And we also looked in the sort of system engineering area of CMMI and INCOSI. And we also looked at the um, work coming out from the sort of agile community, Scrum, DSDM. And um, basically, none, none of those covered everything we needed. And we did an analysis at the end of the version one work and found that each of them had a blind spot. So actually, folks, you have got in your standard something that is more complete than any other major published document on portfolio program and project management. The other thing on many of them, they, they split it up into different pieces and they don't quite sort of match together. So let's think who was involved. Uh, somebody asked this of Fiona this morning. And you see on the screen now, these are all the folks, the departments that were involved. And you, as you expect, there's the big departments of state. There's a few ALBs. Notice the um, devolved um, administrations are there. There's the Welsh government and Scottish government sitting in there. And the, the top in the middle there, Department of Health and Social Care. And um, over the period since the first version came out, then we've had different working groups bringing different people. So it's not just been one group all the way through. It's, it's been building on experience through that, that period. Hence why we have a version two after trialing the version one, because it's um, polished a few rough edges along the way. Now, the primary readers, re readers of the document, really, it's not about um, it's not about how do you manage an individual project. This is about how should an organization, an NHS trust or whatever, set up itself so that it is a precise, produces a good environment for project management. So very much so permanent secretaries, directors general, chief operating officers, very much focused on this. This sort of document can give them the sort of questions they need to ask. Um, so that's at the top level. Then we look at senior responsible owners, of course. Um, they're the own the business case, they're the primary risk takers. And then we look at obviously program project managers, assurance bodies, and, and of course the PMOs. And particularly, and we'll come to this later, those of you in a PMO, and I expect there's quite a few out there, um, to develop the organization's internal PPM methods. So the functional standards are aimed at organizations, not just to individual programs and projects. And you'll find that when you look at it. So that's a bit of the context. Where did it come from? Who was involved? And where did we draw all this material together before we got it into the, into the document? It is actually a very slim document. I don't know if you can see on my little screen, it's very, very thin, that, that, that's actually it. It's um, not, a, not a great tome. So don't expect three copies of your, your sort of Prince 2 manual size or anything like that. It, it's, it is thin. So what I'm going to do is just pick out a few pointers in here. Um, what we've got, it's going to go through the principles, the roles, the life cycle, the practices. And yeah, yeah, the, the agile word is in. So how does that go into it? So let's go through these a bit at a time. The project delivery principles, and these, these apply to um, portfolios, programs, and projects, because we're looking at it holistically, so it all joins up. And um, the, the, um, every standard has a set of principles at the front. Now, there's 10 principles here. The, the one right at the bottom 
ethics and codes of conduct, that's the one that's all about behaviours. It's very difficult to put the right behaviours into a standard. But in the public sector, has lots of lots of material because the code of conduct and ethics, whether you're doing project delivery or doing something else, are often the same, or they should be the same. And so um, that sort of um, stuff is a, is a constant through all of them. Other ones to point out, um, number three, proportionate and appropriate governance. What this says is, if you've got a small project, you manage it like a small project. Um, you don't pretend it's something big and enormous. You you um you cut things to suit the cloth, or cut the cloth to suit things. Rather, sorry about the way around. Um, it's it has to be pro uh, proportionate. Don't spend a million pounds on something that's only worth half a million and appropriate. The sort of way you approach it has to meet the type of work you're doing. Very small team, your risk log can be on a whiteboard if you're all co-located in a room for a short project. But otherwise, if you're a large extended team, obviously we know they go in different places. Number six, defined and tailored working methods. It allows any sort of working methods because those are the how you do things. And But they have to say, well, let me know what they are. And if, of course, they've been from a sort of standard one that, um, let's say, another organization has produced or your own has, then you have to allow tailoring. I, that's the way you get it proportionate and appropriate. So tailoring is a big feature. Another one to point out is plan transition and closure. Um, producing outputs, great. Big tick in the box, so what? It's the outcomes, it's the business and societal changes that matter. And so in there is very much planning how that business and societal change happens. And that has to be planned in there and it takes time and it costs money, as probably you folks well know. So those are all built in to the principles. And these principles apply regardless. So for instance, if the standard doesn't have something in it that you're looking for, then these principles apply anyway. So they, they, they keep you sort of um, going in the right direction, having the, the right mindset when you're doing things. The roles, well, as I've sort of said, if you looked at the, um, the who the readership is, they're aimed at the people across government at the top. They're aimed at your accounting officer or your CEO. They're aimed at people who are directing or managing your portfolios. And then of course, all those project program team members. and don't worry if these don't suit your job titles, that doesn't matter. These are deliberately roles. And if you want to call your project manager a program director, that's up to you and your job families and whatever. But it's about keeping it simple and um, understandable. Uh, people change job titles like some people change underwear. So those are, that's the sort of, all those roles are described. So we got a consistency across, across government. So we all understand what those mean. And those top two are very important. Remember the Toberone diagram? So we have a senior officer responsible for managing a function across government. That's what it's called in the standard. Bit of a mouthful. That's actually Nick Harrison in IPA. But um, he might change his job title from CEO IPA or it may go somewhere else. Who, who knows what the future is? We're building these things to be future proof as far as we can. And then in your own organizations, there'll be a senior officer accountable for managing a function in an arm's length body. So that's probably head of your, your own sort of project delivery function within your, um, within your organization. And these are the roles that sort of bind it all together. And they're all described in yeah, a standard, which is a standard for actually doing standards and how the functions are done, GovS001. Googling these will find them easily. So, that's a bit of the intro bit. So what about now we're into the, the middle middle chunks, the portfolios. For those of you familiar with managed portfolios, there'd be no surprise there's sort of a, a figure of 80 sort of um, processy thing here. So for instance, over here, you've got the um, set the vision, set the targets, whatever that you need. And over this bit, it's about authorizing programs, projects, other related work to start on, monitoring those, um, reporting, looking at it, what it looks like holistically, and if necessary, revalidating that your business plan, business strategy, portfolio plan, portfolio strategy are okay. If they're not, you might have to go back and readjust those. It's, um, dare I say it, a very agile thing, portfolio management rendered on properly. And um, 
so a lot of the stuff if you're following management portfolios a lot of the stuff is in there um, these little diamonds you'll notice as you go as i go through the sides we've used repeating iconography a diamond where my laser pointer is now is often a decision one of these sort of lozenge shaped things is often an, well it's always an assurance review so you can see there's two big decisions up here portfolio vision strategy and plan and authorizing a work component to start. So that work component could be a project or a program or a stage of a project or a tranche of a program. Let's go and look at projects. Now, projects comprise stages. Here we are. Decisions to start each stage. Assurance reviews to happen before a decision. We'll come to that in a little bit more detail. And if we look down here, we can see like a semi-Gantt showing the stages as they go. Notice they can overlap because these decisions are to start a stage. Um, it's great looking backwards, but I don't know a senior leader who makes decisions walking backwards. They say, this is what we're going to do. Um, if we, um, th that, that actually is, is quite important because otherwise you can get yourself right tied up in a knot if you have to make them butt face back to back like um, Prince Two does at the moment. Although there is a white paper out there, um, which is proposing moving to the approach we've got here. So that is the typical life cycle. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about life cycles and what these stages are and what those names mean going. But notice there's a definitive start and there's a definite end here. So these bubbles are stuff that happens before the project starts and stuff that happens after the project starts. So if we look at these gating again, here we are, it's the gate, it's a decision point that represents the start of a stage. So it's authorizing work to start. What do those decision makers make their, um, make their decisions based on? A set of criteria, okay? And it gives the outlines of those in the standard. And then the um, project delivery framework has lots more detail on what those could be. And so the work of actually of doing the project is where the information comes from to inform the decision makers. And then if there's the assurance review, that findings add to it. Basically, if there is no insurance review, this should happen anyway. Assurance is assurance. It's not just doing. So these decisions are what really design and determine your life cycle choices, because the riskier your project or the more regulated, the more life cycle stages there are, the simpler it is, the fewer it can be just as you've learned if you did your Prince 2 type training. So this life cycle depiction here um, is what they call in the standard, the reference life cycle. So that's the basis. And what basically in feasibility, you have a long list of stuff. You look really broad and shallow and maybe come up with a short list. The appraiser looks at a short list and then maybe select, well, should select one option to go forward to, which is defined. And then at this point here, that's when there'd be a full business case and in you go into the delivery. But of course, the tailoring means that if we, um, if we have something more complicated, you might split feasibility into pre-feasibility and feasibility. I don't know if any of you have seen Eddie Oberg's work on foggy projects and stuff like that and quests Basically, in Quest, you say, go off, take this amount of money, this amount of time, go off and find out what you can and come back and let me know. That's effectively what you're doing in a staged approach to project management. It's like macro agile. You're just saying, here we are, here's um, £100,000, go off and find, come back in four months and tell me what's going on. And we'll just make another decision whether to move forward. So even if you're using this reference life cycle, you, you, you can and you should, in many cases, put interims decision points in. Remember, it's driven by decisions. Similarly, if it's very simple, you might ram the feasibility and appraisal stages together, or you might ram the appraisal and definition stages together. And if um, there's still some reasonable risk over um, the delivery stage, you might actually take out as a separate stage trials. Trials are, are, are pretty public. And so reputation and everything is, is at stake. So often having a distinct decision to go public with something um, is, is, um, is a business decision. It's about um, reputation and what can go wrong. So there's um, ways this can be adapted 
And one of the final adaptions is actually, I've, we've seen this in the MOD, where they, they take the operation pitch, rather than it just being initial operation, just to tune it and get it going for maybe three, four months or whatever, they actually take it for the full life of the outputs or the solution. So it's more like a, a system or asset life cycle. Often better run as a program, but it is feasible in some circumstances here. And so that goes on, and then you've got a disposal that's clear up the mess at the end sort of stage. Now, that's a lot of permutations there, but the names and the content of the stages can change as well. And I'll show you a classic example of that, and it's in, it's in the standard in a few slides time. But you can change the content and you can change the names of things to suit your circumstances and your projects. Programs, well, programs, just as projects have stages, programs have tranches. Um, yeah, a phase of a project is called a stage and a phase of a program is called a tranche. And basically a program can own, need only have one tranche, the program itself, or it might benefit from being chunked up. And it's really a matter of what's the best way of chunking the work up and managing it. So we've got good accountability, control and visibility. And you've got, so you've got a story going from sort of top left to bottom right. Otherwise, the features, the decisions in a program are often totally dependent on the decisions made at project level. And often the assurance reviews are a collation and ramming together of assurance reviews for some project stuff at the same time. So looking at an individual major decision to see how safe it is, uh, and as well as looking the impact of that decision on the effects on the overall program's objectives. Now, that really brings a point program or project. Um, is it a program? Is it a project? Sometimes people ask me. And I'm thinking, well, actually, it doesn't matter, really. Sometimes it's obvious something's a project. Sometimes it's obvious it's a program, but sometimes it's not. And does that really matter? No, because it's how you choose to manage it. You look at the work, you look at how it's chunked up, you look at the interdependencies and think, how best is it to manage this? Would it be better managed as a program or managed as a project? For instance, when I worked on Connecting for Health, um, we often looked at projects within our programs and or work packages, because an enabling project and a work package can look similar. But if we felt a life cycle added value, we managed it as a project. If not, we managed it as a work package. And if we looked at the other end of the scale, we had a program with three sub programs, if you like, uh, mental health, community health, then um, GPs, and then the um, big acute, acute health. And um, basically, we could have managed it as a portfolio with three programs. It was just a choice, and um, that, that's fine. And often remember that when you start the work, you don't might not even know how it's going to work. So in a stage or phased approach, you actually build this as you go along. Which brings us to the management practices. Those of you who are Prince 2, you'll recognize some of these. Initiating, project equivalent, controlling, we call it managing here, closing, directing, managing a work package, that's the product delivery in Prince 2. But initiating, we've um, called identifying, and we've got an overseeing. Now notice we've said program and project here. Um, that's because they're very similar at a sort of standard level. And um, it's in the how that you get the real difference and in the life cycles. And notice this ties up, the initiating needn't be all the first stage, the closing needn't be all the second stage. So you can line it all up. And then the other feature around the supporting ones, plan and control. Much of this you recognize, risks. Ah, Prince2 has issues around with change control, we've separated them. Um, over here, traceability. If you can't trace from different elements of your program or your project or your work package, say to an element of the solution or to the supplier doing it, you're going to have real problems when it comes to change control. So traceability is a big factor in there. Um, most of the top ones you'll probably recognize in doing already. Go to the bottom ones, and it's a lot of it's quite new for you, I imagine. What's project management standard doing with user needs design development integration? Well, basically, if you produce if you, no matter how well you manage your program or projects, 
if what you produce isn't good enough, you've got a failure on your hands. It's, it's an and. So for instance, with Crossrail, they're very, very proud of their methods and approaches, etc. Yet look at the delays because of the product. So if you are managing something like this, if you do not understand how the actual outputs are produced, what to measure, what to look at in terms of assessing progress, risk, etc. Look at validation, I does it meet the user needs? Um, then you're really not in control of your project or program. So we've rammed them together into the same standard to make sure that is absolutely up there. So verification, validation, development, integration. And when you look at the description, we don't care if it's sequential or iterative. Both of them are allowed. Which brings me really that make sure you don't confuse life cycle and delivery approach. Those are the words we use in the standard and they are, they are different. So for instance, let me just get my pen out. If I got a life cycle stage, it's governed by time. And then there's another stage. If you find an error here, you can't go back to the previous stage and sort it out because you haven't got a TARDIS. What happens is you have to sort it out and do rework here in the stage where you found it. So what happens is these life cycles are purely driven by um, purely driven by, by time. Now what happens is when you're doing this rework, you might have to revisit requirements or whatever. So actually you've got, what you're doing is using iterative processes in there. So in other words, your processes, your delivery approach can be whatever you want, but they're always within a time box called a stage or a work package. So there's the life cycle. We can go live once, we can develop it in one chunk. We might develop it in one chunk and then incrementally tout. So if you're, um, you've got four hospitals in your trust, you might not do something in all the hospitals at once. You may do it one at a time. Um, you may develop it, the actual outputs in a number of chunks and then integrate them at the end, or you may continuously integrate them. But the delivery method could be iterative all the way through. Or you could do the same thing and have a sort of predictive approach with some iterative and some hybrid in there. So they are separate. If you look at it that way, the whole sort of agile world becomes simpler. And talking of which, the life cycle, the, the, um, the reference one, this is what happens when we look at almost a pure agile software delivery. So GDS did this one. The first chunk they call delete discovery. And there's two alphas, private beta, public beta. And the reference points, very much here they are. That's the easiest reference point you can find is the business cases because they're about how, um, how much reliability, how confident are we, we're going to actually be getting it anywhere. Implementing the standard. Well, basically, I got to just look at three things there, build on what you have, take it a step at a time, then we'll look at the assessment framework. If we look at an individual project, Probably most of them you, you're using PRINCE2 at the moment. And what you have to do is look at the sort of context, type, scale, complexity of your work, and you produce your project initiation document, and that's it. Um, because the standard has a lot more in it, you've also, in the future, you'll have to take these into account as well. I and mean, you're doing it anyway, because you couldn't get any result if you hadn't. We're just sort of making it more obvious. So that's about tailoring. You tailor from prints to the actual documentation. Now then, if you have an organization, say PPM method, then the people doing the work over here would use that directly. And that, that PPM method would then draw on all of this sort of stuff like MOP, MSP, prints 2 all your other internal processes, and they'll all be under the auspices of the standard to make sure you've got it complete. So you've probably got an awful lot of this stuff in place already. We're just making it much more explicit because believe it or not, we, one of the big um, offices of state, when they asked me to look at how much they covered in their PPM method of the version one standard, and it's not that much different from what the version two that you're looking at uh, that's for you now, um, they found they only had 45% coverage. Um, 
they had you know the real big hitting stuff but still only covered 45 percent what was in there now the guy i was working with he was really pleased because he'd been saying that all along but the seniors wouldn't accept that so when we were able to show explicitly these are the gaps then they were able to get their their teams together and start working on it so my advice on um ooh, my advice on on actually implementing the standard um Draw like when we we actually develop standard. Draw on all your best practice sources. You know, Prince Two Praxis is out there. I think there's going to be a presentation. I think tomorrow on that from Adrian Dooley. Um, all the sort of bodies of knowledge. You know, draw on what you already have and get that terminology fixed early. Hopefully, building off what there is in the, the from IPA because that will add a consistency, which allows things easier to share. Um, but don't expect to please everyone all the time. I was asked why I chose certain words, and that was because that was my authority to do that with consensus. There's always going to be, is it this or that? You just have to make a decision and then go consistently with that decision. Design the architecture. How do all the bits fit together? Now, the standard itself is actually not a bad architecture to hook your PPM method on because it's, it's designed that way. Uh, so um, that sort of chunk it up. You often have a bit about risk, a bit about issues and whatever. Well, that's how the standard's done. You can emulate that in how you design and build the bits of your method. And But do make it independent of your organization, its structure and everything, because go for a long shelf life. If you have a reorganization, the last thing you want to do is rewrite all your PPM methods and things. You don't need to. We're in a changing world. We are used to it. We should be role driven regardless of people's departments and job titles. Um, and of course, use the people that have the credibility to do the work because that's they're the change agents. And I often find you start off with work like this, you have about 25 people volunteer and you get about eight or nine who really do the work. And you go back to some the rest of the 10 who've stopped off and they said, are you bored now? And they just said, no, I'm happy with what the others are doing, I'm busy. So, um, you know, do harness those people that have the credibility of their peers and also make sure you can tailor things. If you have a website, make sure people can do feedback on that. And of course, engage your stakeholders early throughout and respond quickly. There's nothing worse than people giving feedback and perhaps having a blank, nothing come back, back at them. The, um, onto the assessment framework now, this is very new. Um, and basically, it puts you as an organization, not individual projects, as an organization in developing good, better, best. And the minimum we expect is good. So it would be all the shall statements, plus the important shoulds, as decided by the sort of group from all the different government departments that are involved in the development of this. Um, it's organized into themes they're into practice areas and criteria so the themes there's seven of them governance leadership so people that's really important we feel then there's your obviously portfolio program then a lot of the supporting practices planning control finance and commercial we split out separately here because they are run under different standards so that's why we deliberately done those second but um the assessment framework is there to keep focused now if we look at just one of these themes there we are, it's in the, um, say for instance, in planning and control, theme five, you'll see there's risk and issues management, practice area 5.4. And what it has in it is a set of criteria. If you meet these criteria, all the ones in the left-hand column, you're good. If you meet the ones in the middle, they're better. Basically, good means doing one or one project or one program or one simple portfolio at a time, you're okay. Better means you've started, got organizational wide approaches so you can share and learn and keep that learning in the organization. And best is mostly about improving, you know, driven from hard data. So that, that's, that's crudely what they are. And if you do an assessment, you can end up with a, um, a sort of rose diagram showing where you are. Now, if you just miss one item in good, you stay in developing, no matter what else is there. It's very, very harsh like that. It takes the same approach as the CMMI maturity method in that respect. So we also have percentage scores. So if we look down here, we can see this 
program and project management is in development. But hey, look, 72%. Hmm, that's quite good. Um, in fact, it's only 2% below this good at, at 76. And this good is at 53. So we have to think, well, what's going on here? What we need to do, what we can do is we can see that whilst we're in development, we're on a good pathway to sorting it out. And what this does is it helps you focus. During the trial, one of the government organizations hated the output because it didn't show them up in a very good light. And they were a bit upset, really. But basically, the others there said, well, actually, the, the, the output was right. They are in, in that state. But now they can focus where they need to. And not everybody has to be best. So for instance, each of the themes, you can set where you need to be. So quite honestly, some project delivery isn't the most high priority thing for most people in most organizations. The, some of it, it is, but basically you can set where you need to do. If you're doing very few projects in your organization and they're not a huge, huge you know, sort of impact, um, then you know, you, you down at good would, might be okay. I think most people will be at least better in, in any sizable government organization. And a few of them have to be best because that's the nature of what they're doing. So implementing the standard. Uh, it's about being good, better or best, whatever you choose and not looking good, better and best. So it isn't sort of, um, this is what I want to look. We're not intending to collate all the data from many of these assessment frameworks, if you choose to use that, because you can use other maturity models to help you pinpoint where you want to improve. It's just there for you to use if you need to. The standard is mandatory, but the use of the assessment framework is encouraged, but not necessarily a must do. The outputs of the assessment framework are there to challenge you and use it along with other feedback. It shouldn't be the only thing you're doing. And remember, it's not a sprint. You have other priorities, you have other pressures and constraints. So to truly embed and get good at this is more like a marathon than a sprint. You know, you, you can pick in some organizations in terms of years, but if use your assessment framework to keep focused. So there we are, a romp through. Where did it come from? What are its key features and some hints of that? Now, um, we're going to show you a short video in a second, and then Owen Kennedy from Infrastructure and Projects Authority is going to join me for the questions and answer sessions. And the two books there, they're the ones that um, were mentioned. So some lucky folks out there will get, get those books as part of your prize for this conference. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Robert mentioned, I'm Owen Kennedy uh, from the Infrastructure Projects Authority, where I'm the Head of Portfolio Function and Standards, uh, and we worked with Robert uh, on developing our, our standard. I'm going to help facilitate this Q&A session. Um, we've got a handful of questions uh, that have come through, and I'm just going to take them in the, in the order that they've been voted on. 
uh, uh, in the screen. Uh, so Robert, first question we've got is, there's always a lot of mention of project and programme management, but where does change management fit into the, the standard? Okay, I, I think the the artif I think the, this vision between change management and program project management is a bit artificial because we're all about getting outcomes. The whole of the project delivery standard is focused on outcomes, i.e., business and societal changes. So change is inherent in that, and one of the supporting practices in there is about business and societal change. It's actually there and it's there all the time. One of the things in there also is validation actually making sure we are getting what we need and also in there is about stakeholder engagement and communication so a lot of the um, aspects the hooks are there remember the standard doesn't tell you how to do this um, there's loads of different theories of change um, management etc and then any of those could be used and ipa does produce for you as well um, documents and like seven lenses of change and things like that so it's sort of in actually bound into it you you, you can't get you can't use the standard and ignore business change or societal change. It, it's inherent. Thanks, Robert. Um, next question is one that uh, I, I, I'm interested in. Uh, so it says, this looks really helpful in creating consistency of language and frameworks, but how do you suggest we convince executives to buy into this level of discipline? You want me to ask that one? <laughs> oh, I think you you start. You start, then I'll okay. come in. <clears throat> I, I think th this is always an interesting one. Because remember, when executives are talking, they don't give a stuff whether it's a program or a project. The words are interchangeable. You know, you've got programs that are called names by projects. So what? We aren't going to change the way people chatter. We aren't going to change. Yeah, you know, We shouldn't do either, really. So what I say is that when you produce things, if you're producing your, your, your methods and stuff like that, if you're encouraging people to, when they write their the documentation to use the right words the right words will become visible and if somebody uses the wrong words don't be arsey and am i allowed to say that don't be don't be an idiot and correct them particularly if they're one of them senior people um then you can what what you, what you do is just mirror it back to them using the correct word um you know you aren't going to change that overnight but you've if you've got the pen you're writing your methods you're writing documents encourage people to use the right stuff and it will it will be there. Yeah, um, I I agree, and I think there's I mean, one of the things to 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 mention just because the we we've mentioned consistency of language. Uh, another part of the functional standard suite is a common glossary, um, which brings all of the languages of all the standards together uh, and agrees a, a fixed definition for them. I, I think the other thing to, to sort of bear in mind is, and, and this is going to sound odd, but I eventually want to get to a point where the standard is always there, but it's almost in the background. Um, um, designing what works for you in your departments, in your organizations while observing the standard, um, it'll almost make it sort of become second nature and you will comply with the standard uh, uh, almost indirectly. Uh, yeah. by following your 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 methodologies etc yeah there's that diagram i showed wasn't it towards the end where you've got the, the standard on the left the individual project on the right and then they use your internal method whoever's writing those internal methods that's where the power is that's the other people that are going to change it so if they use your method they should be then automatically complying yes standard. exactly the nice thing about standard it is um it is so 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 thin that for the seniors to challenge and that's their job mm -hmm this is the sort of short stories in here and that's they say well how are you dealing that show me how are you dealing with this oh you aren't you meant to be looking at this i haven't seen anything on that and that's where the the the, the, the um positive challenge happens on anything we're doing and of course this has the right words in it so they might ask the questions using the right words <laughs> yes and, and i think the, the other thing as well worth pointing out is that um obviously version two came out in july we've had version one uh what since 2018 i think it was and um the other thing to bear in mind is a, a lot of our our kind of big main suppliers with government they have adopted this they look at this document as well okay this is how government works um uh, and so they adopt they, they've been adopting this standard and these practices so that they can integrate with us as seamlessly as possible uh which i think is, a, is, a, is another real kind of benefit for us then observing it as well um absolutely 
next question. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, what do you feel are the biggest lessons learned during the global pandemic and its main impacts on future project delivery methodology and successes? So I suppose from a, from a slant of standards and standardization of project delivery, Robert. Okay. Right. For as far as standard goes, what I was doing, observing, because I um, as a sort of observer, um, I, I'm not full time with you guys, um, was challenging myself on what we'd written there with the with the working group, um, as what might I take out due to say what I'm seeing on the ground, this building of the um, the nightingales and stuff like that, and actually there isn't because it's the appropriate proportionate, it's, it's risk. And risk is all, it, that, that's where it is, it's risk. What would go wrong if we did do it? Or what could go wrong in those cases if we didn't do it? Because sometimes that's the choice. And I think the thing in the pandemic or where there's an emergency situation, people are prepared to take higher risks and accept there's going to be problems. So I didn't see any sort of clauses in there. I'd say, no, I, I'd, I'd scribble that out because it's in the how you do it that matters. You know, anyone who follows like a Prince2 manual by the letter is probably not a very good project manager. It's the tailoring. It's how do you do it, bearing in mind risk, risk, and more risk. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think my observation of, of some of the, the, the projects and programs that came about because of the pandemic um, is that Robert's exactly right. It, it's it's there's nothing that really needs to change um the successes were as robert said being a, a bit more willing to take some risk but also um it's sort of that sort of it, it's that you know that, that that common thing happens when the sort of projects of adversity people actually all get in together there is that bigger focus on things um and whilst things were happening quicker decisions were making being made quicker governance was being taken through quicker you actually had people following the standards and processes properly you actually had people sort of really making sure things were set up for success in a high pressure situation um i think the thing that we need to learn is that when we've got slower time really focusing in on projects at the beginning making sure they're set up properly is actually important does require that sort of uh, uh, attention from a, from a, from across the stakeholders yeah, um, and can't be seen, seen as something to be ignored, really. Yeah, I think that the, 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 if the objectives tend to be clearer. Mm. And if your objectives are clearer, people actually work better together because they've got that shared shared and shared understanding of the same objective, rather than this sort of semi-political type of projects where everyone's trying to squidge it into their own image or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And state stakeholder <laughs> disagreement was definitely lower for uh for, for 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 pandemic projects yeah um so this one might be for me um what has been the common strategy around these standards to support engagement and uptake and do we have any lessons to share um so i think so i mean there has been a comms plan um it has been a central comms plan from the cabinet office because um uh we've been communicating about the full functional suite together um, so whilst each individual functions are supporting that comms plan, it, it's really actually talking about the suite. Um, uh, so sort of some of the sort of the key things is actually there's been some dear accounting officer letters that have gone out, really setting out what the functional model is, what functional standards are, uh, and making clear what their responsibility is in in uh, in. Um, in, in, in making sure that these are, are, are complied with now that they've been mandated. Um, some of the things that we're doing in the IPA, um, starting in the new financial year, is making sure that, that we sort of strengthen our function around this. Uh, so, for example, Robert mentioned um, the, the role of head of function in an organisation. Uh, so the IPA is, is is looking at actually making sure each department has one of those and then um, helping those departments make sure each ALB has one of those and that there's real kind of join up through to uh, Nick Smallwood, who's, our, who's the chief executive of, of, of the IPA, um, uh, and making sure that's, there's that flow and there's a real objective about together taking the function forward, which will be 
massively underpinned by the standard. I think my big lesson on this, especially if any of you listening to this are, are responsible for, for methodologies, is do it together. Um, we have got one of the biggest uptakes and sort of joint feeling of ownership of, 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 of the product delivery standard. Um, and it's because we wrote it with the function. We wrote it with the profession. We didn't go away and do it in isolation. We didn't uh, uh, impose it. Um, we really had, uh, I mean, God, I think, what, for version two, was it a good six, seven months of just regularly meeting with people, iterating, debating, discussing? Yeah, yeah it was. Um, and then coming to a consensus. Um, and I think, actually, I, I think, I mean, I think that's what the, the BSI actually dis actually has as part of their definition of what a standard is is that it's yeah. consensus from practitioners i borrowed a lot of that sort of information because if you think it's difficult trying to get uk government public sector lined up you try doing it with 40 or 50 different countries around the world and that's why i took a lot of the learnings i've had from there to bring in to help you guys yes exactly um and i think we've probably got time for maybe one more question i think um it depends how much we talk <laughs> yeah true this will be a quick um, one the next one so this is uh, thinking about a method of assessing our maturity status relative to where we need to be i was considering using p3m3 but i'm now assuming that this is more appropriate for us in the nhs so i think this is getting towards the assessment framework yeah okay p3m3 is very much about it, it's a maturity model okay it's designed for that and it's it's a lot bigger and it's a lot more effort um the the sort of levels in p3m3 do align up roughly roughly i say with um with the sort of good better best on two two three and four but um it's not in we don't intend the assessment framework to be a replacement for p3m3 and i think some organizations already said they're still going to go ahead with both temporarily because to see what types of different answers they get then work out which is the better one to continue with but of course the assessment framework is there now free so you could try that to see how it feels then dip your toe in the water of p3m3 to see what different and value-added information it might give we're not saying it's the only tool yeah i i, I agree i think they, they they sort of have slightly a diff different um objectives um, I think the thing also to bear in mind is the assessment framework is designed to test an entire organization. So this would be to test, you know, uh, DHSC's project yeah. delivery function, not yeah. an individual project or a program, whereas P3M3, you, 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 you could apply that to, to, yeah. to a project. Um, and also, I think the other thing as well is, is the assessment framework, it, and I suppose I do have to sell this, is, is it is about driving you to be better. I've always found P3M3 is a lot of sort of tick boxing. Do I do this tick? Do I do that tick? Uh, you've got a lot more sort of um, description over kind of what the direction is. Um, but I think we've only got a couple of minutes left for the session. So I think we're going to have to wrap up the Q&A and hand uh, back. I can answer that last one very quickly. Oh, it's go on then. Any methodology is what alignment to project type or project methodology is the government functional standard. Any project methodology providing it's sensible um, and, and meets the standard. It isn't aligned to anything. Obviously, it's a lot of direct relationship you can see to Prince too, because that's what we built on, built on what you've already got. That was one of my lessons, wasn't it? And that actually helped a lot because the terminology has just trickled right through. So basically, it doesn't, it's any type of project methodology, praxis, the Prince 2 MSP or whatever, but you make your own for your organization because none of them have everything the standard needs. Thanks, Robert. I think we're going to, I think we're going to pipe Paul back now, back in now, I think, to, to sort of wrap up the session. Great. Thanks very much. I mean, I, I want to give a huge thanks uh, to Robert for, for leading us through that, that interesting and very informative session and for Owen for contributing uh, so much uh, on the questions at the end to sort of set out where it's coming from, from, from a government perspective. Um, I also want to thank all of you um, online for, for your time um, in joining the session um, with us today. Um, I hope you've got a lot uh, out of it and I hope that you uh, continue to enjoy the, the Project Futures Festival throughout the 
the rest of the week. And I think that's probably pretty much our time up. So I think we probably should bring it to a close there. But thank you once again, uh, Robert, Owen and everyone for participating. Mm-hmm.